Tom Hafer, and this is Muller's Reborn, a special presentation of SeaGov, the Calcasieu Parish Government Channel. In this program, we'll take a look at the history of this nearly 100-year-old building and the once thriving business that it housed. We'll hear how this historic structure was given to the Calcasieu Parish Police Jury and the efforts they made to revive it. We'll meet many employees of Muller's who still get together annually. We'll take a look at the building in its new form, Muller's Lofts. We'll meet the people who gave Muller's new life. And we'll have a chance to reminisce about Muller's and what made it so special. Part of it is that if you were a child being brought to Muller's for the first time, uh, first off, you had the magic of the, uh, the escalator, which was an unusual, it was rare and, and uh, certainly unusual. It was uh, sort of a, uh, the closest you were going to get to Disneyland in southwest Louisiana. Of course, I remember Muller's all my life. Uh, I grew up in Sulphur, but we drove over here for our clothing and for toys and jewelry and china and glassware and just anything, that, the bedding and uh, for her furniture, so we really, uh, we depended upon Mullins a great deal. For anybody here, for decades and decades, it was the main store to go to, especially prior to, you know, suburban type malls coming into, into being. So that, that probably kept us going the whole time was its, its attachment to our area for, for the folks here emotionally. It was very important. It was a crossroads. It was more of an experience. You wore gloves to go to Muller's, you know. Uh, there are people who tell stories of that. You know, you wore a hat, you wore gloves, you wore your Sunday best to go to Muller's because you were going to be judged. It wasn't a, a casual sort of thing. The story of Muller's begins in Alsace, a region of France near the German border. In 1870, Alsace was claimed by Germany as part of the spoils of victory in the Franco-Prussian War. Many Alsatians fled. One of those who left was a 16-year-old woman named Julie Kaufman, who along with her brother Joseph came to the United States to settle in Donaldsonville near New Orleans. Joseph Kaufman died soon after their arrival, and Julie Kaufman was forced to fend for herself. She proved quite capable. She married Isidore Muller in 1877 and quickly had two children, Maurice and Dora Muller. Isidore Muller died in a yellow fever outbreak in 1878, and Julie Muller was on her own once again. She moved to New Orleans and opened a dressmaking and millinery business to support her two young children. Julie Muller had a distant cousin, Leopold Kaufman, who lived in Lake Charles, and she moved her family here in 1882, opening Muller's on the southeast corner of Division and Ryan Streets, once again making dresses in the burgeoning southwest Louisiana town. From that humble beginning came a giant department store. This small wooden structure couldn't contain the thriving business for long, and Muller built a new two-story brick building on the same location in 1893. That same year, Julie Muller married Simon Marks. He took over as the manager of the business, and the couple had three children, Adolph, Sophie, and Helen. Simon Marks died at 35 in 1901, and Julie's son, Maurice Muller, became manager. He built a third story on the building in the early 1900s. At one time, the Muller's department store was the largest full-line department store between New Orleans and Houston. And that is something to say. Uh, it was the uh, gemstone of Lake Charles's downtown. It was the place where literally you could get baby shoes to coffins because at one time Muller's sold coffins. 1910 was a pivotal year for downtown Lake Charles and for Muller's. A great fire swept through the downtown area, leveling dozens of buildings. While Muller's was spared, the resulting building boom that produced many of the most famous structures in the city encouraged Muller's to build a new store across Division Street. The main portion of the state-of-the-art department store completed in 1913 became the Muller's remembered by so many in Lake Charles and is the building that has now become Muller's Lofts. The facility itself, the building, uh, historically speaking, was one of the post-Great Fire buildings, and it was built at a time when there was an enormous amount of energy and economic development and uh, a great deal of promise in, in what Southwest Louisiana was to become. Uh, the Great Fire leveled out large portions of downtown Lake Charles, Muller's building, the front part of the building, the building on the corner of Ryan and, 
division was designed in the style of the great multi-story department stores a la uh, D.H. Holmes, a la uh, Maison Blanche, uh, a la Hyman's and Lafayette. Uh, and like those buildings, it provided a lot of services to customers in southwest Louisiana. Muller's thrived in the teens and 20s under the leadership of Maurice Muller. Lake Charles continued to grow, and Muller's was its top retailer. Julie Kaufman Muller Marx died in 1924 at the age of 70. The 30s were a difficult time for Muller's, as the Great Depression caused sales to plummet. Maurice Muller retired in 1930, and his half-brother, Adolph Marx, took over as manager. Muller's installed the first commercial air conditioner in Lake Charles in their store in 1937. The petrochemical industries began arriving in Lake Charles, and the economy boomed again in the 40s. The store continued on the cutting edge of mid-20th century technology with a major expansion begun in 1949. When completed in 1951, the building had greatly expanded their sales space and added the first escalator in the city. The city was growing. Muller's was still king of retail, and times were good in downtown Lake Charles. We always came here as a family from Cameron because I lived in Cameron, and that was a, a, daytime, a day thing that you would do. You'd pack the car in the morning, bring the ice chest to come and shop in Lake Charles, and, but Muller's was, you'd spend the day shopping for eight children at Muller's, and then we'd grocery shop and go home. But uh, Muller's was the first place that you came, and then well, downtown was booming then. Uh, and there was always good places to eat, places to, wonderful shoe shops, wonderful men's shops, but we always came here first. It's a great place to work. I mean, you met, you met everybody that was here, you know. Muller's family night at Muller's on Thursday night was a big time. We saw all the telephone company people coming in during the day. It was just a, you know, place to be. It was part of a very vibrant downtown uh, into the mm, into the early 70s, actually downtown Lake Charles was essentially non, uh, an unbroken line of storefronts from Mill Street all the way to Kirby on both sides of Ryan. And you could find everything from department stores like Muller's to specialty stores, uh, stationery stores, drug stores, you name it, you could find it on Ryan Street in Lake Charles. Adolph Marx retired in 1964 and for the first time, management of the store left the Muller Marx family. As the uh, urban sprawl and the automobile culture took over, Muller's attempted to move along with it. Muller's opened a, a department store in uh, Derrida, it tried to expand. It opened a, a unit in the Prion Lake Mall. And uh, even with that, the, the demographics of the town, the way the town was growing, the fact that gas was cheap, uh, it found that it was losing out to the uh, bigger uh, uh, stores that were impinging on its particular market. Muller's remodeled again in 1972. That same year, the Prion Lake Mall opened. People shopped differently in the 70s and 80s than they did in the 40s and 50s. Muller's gallantly tried to adapt, but the oil bust of the 1980s was the last nail in the coffin as Muller's closed for good in 1985. The business was gone, but Southwest Louisiana would never forget Muller's. The former employees began having annual reunions. Every year at Christmas time, the store used to have a Christmas party. The uh, store would supply the meat, and uh, all the employees would bring their favorite covered dishes. And uh, when the store closed, we figured, well, that's it. We'll never see anybody ever again. And uh, Mr. Sherwood said, no, we're not going to do that. So he hosted the first one, and with this past February was our 20th. And it's just the idea, everybody gets to see everybody once a year, reminisce about what happened in the past year, still talk about things that went on in, in, in the store, and uh, like several people have probably said today, we were a family. It, you know, it goes a long ways to show that you were a family. And we have a reunion every third uh, Sunday of February, and I've only missed one in 20 years. <laughs> It was my worst fear, and a lot of us' worst fear, that this building was going to go much the way of old buildings do, become a parking lot. It's nice that the building is still here because the past history has been to knock them down and make room for parking. You know, we've lost a lot of downtown because of that. Back in 1995, the Muller heirs, the family heirs, 
approached the police jury about wanting to donate the building to us. And at the time, we, it was an unusual request, but we studied it and felt like it was something we wanted to honor. So in late 1995, the police jury did accept that donation. It was a formal legal donation. And so we took ownership of the building at that time. Now at the time, the, the heirs didn't have any specific request for how to use it, but they, in their donation, implied that they would want us to do something that would be right for downtown Lake Charles and the whole parish. So we had that in mind once we took the building. Well, they didn't tear it down. They happened to keep it upright. And uh, that uh, it was actually a very bold move because that is contrary to the common thought in, in Lake Charles. It's a common thought that is wrong, and it is a common thought that has been proven over and over again to be a counterproductive move. We do not need more flat parking lots in downtown Lake Charles. There's plenty enough place to park, frankly. We, kn we knew we needed to do something with the building, didn't know exactly what, so the police jury formed a blue ribbon committee at the time, and it was made up of citizens that would help us decide where to go with that. There were two things they wanted to emphasize. The historical significance of Muller's, to try to retain that, and also do something that would fit within plans for downtown Lake Charles. Uh, as you can imagine, the emotional appeal of Muller's is very strong, always has been since it was here, so in some way keep that going if that's possible and then do something with downtown. So that was a key. And in the middle of all of that, the uh, committee, actually we were approached from a firm in New Orleans who wanted to turn it into artist housing. It didn't work out, but that was a good approach and we knew at that time that was a good use. So that was established that a mixed use, adaptive reuse would be a good thing. But most of the problems we had over the years ensuing were not a lack of ideas, a lack of money. Most of the proposals just lacked funding. And ultimately, it was a trip to Sioux City, Iowa, I took with some city officials, probably around 2000, where we learned a lot about what they were doing up there. It gave us more specifics, and ultimately, we did a request for proposals that went out, and this we're, I'm fast forwarding now to about 2002, and to early 2003, and what came back from that was a proposal from FPL which is owned by Roger Landry out of Atlanta, but he is from here. He had a very good interest in the building. He knew of the emotional attachment to the area of this building, so it was a good match. I uh, graduated local guy. I went to ICCS uh, Elementary, graduated at St. Louis High School in 79. Uh, went to school in New Orleans at Tulane, lived there 12 years, moved to Atlanta in 91. Uh, my parents are both have passed away and are buried here. I have upteen amount of relatives. So it was really, and now I have three children, three young daughters. It was a way of me, an excuse really, to come back to town to do something that I love. I love doing these types of projects. This is what I felt I discovered about 10 years ago. This is what was meant for me. Well, to come back home to uh, introduce my children to my family and to do a project, well, I don't, I don't know how it gets any better than that. So in 2003, police jury approved his proposal, which involved selling the building to him under the condition that he do what his proposal said, which was adaptive reuse for what he called Muller's Loss, which is about 40 apartments along with some retail and office space on the first floor. And that was completed in 2004, the final sale of the building. I think it's very typical um, in downtown revitalization, is especially that historic preservation aspect and adaptive reuse that a lot of your downtowns were historic downtowns and thriving downtowns. And in order for them to transition into kind of modern day, we've realized that a lot of the structures are very powerful and useful. And so therefore, um, you know, it's nice to see these adaptive reuses in the downtown area. Specific to Muller's and to Lake Charles downtown, one of the, the biggest impacts I think that it's gonna make is to provide that um, residential component. We felt a major obligation on our hands in a positive way when the building came to us because everybody wanted to know what are you going to do with Muller's and so that sense of responsibility was there and that's one of the reasons we held it for a long time and we tried a lot of things but it would have been a lot easier frankly to just sell the building for the highest bidder but it wouldn't have been the right thing to do. So we, we, we pressed and pressed, but waited till the right conditions came along and there was somebody who was willing to do what needs to be done to make, make it a part of downtown that would benefit everybody. 
So the police jury's role, probably more than anything, was patience to do the right thing as opposed to hurry up and do something with the building that is big and not being used. If you have a good feeling about a building, if you have memories about the building, you want to hang on to it. You may have to have the building change use. You may have to have the building change form a little bit. Certainly the, the apartments are going to break up some of the great beautiful spaces Mullers used to have. It was a wonderful selling floor. But in terms of being able to reuse it, this is the way you reuse the building. As Muller's lofts neared completion, Landry took the Seagov staff on a tour, showing us the renovations and how they kept the memories of Muller's alive in the new apartments. Well, this is the original terrazzo flooring that was uh, installed and built when the original store in 1910 was built. And it has been covered uh, during the renovations in 1951 and then the renovations in 1971. This has been carpeted over, probably due to some uh, slippage, wet conditions. And one of our conditions with the National Park Service, who regulates historic buildings, is to return the terrazzo flooring to its original. And so when we, this was a nice, pleasant surprise for us, when we took up the carpet, the Muller's insignia uh, was below it. When they did the addition to the original building in 1951, the escalators were installed. There were four escalators in the building, and what we've done is removed the other three escalators, but kept the middle escalator on the, on the first floor. And we've kind of uh, made it the centerpiece purposely, even though it was not required to be kept by the National Park Service. But it was the first escalator uh, in southwest Louisiana. And when we actually started construction 19 months ago, the escalator is fully functional, uh, fully operable. And really, we can make it more operable just by hooking up the power. But because of code purposes, we are not allowed to operate it. So, but we wanted to use it as a centerpiece, a showpiece, and that's what we've done. So, and I think this will be the hot topic for the building. Well, this is one of the uh, most significant parts of the building through the National Park Service eyes, where these storefronts. And typically, in a building of this nature, it is. And so, we restored the storefronts to its original character. Um, what's amazing is we had the original blueprints of the building 1910 and then when the building was rehabbed in 1950. We thought and knew that this lead glass was supposed to be here, but in 1950 it was all covered with paneling. And to our pleasant surprise, all the lead glass is here, which is nearly 100 years old. So we restored the storefront, the original floors, the original lead glass, the original paneling. We put back, we had to rebuild the uh, storefront glass to code purposes of this, uh, for this day and age. And we had the original light fixtures here, which we've rewired. And so that's how we preserved the storefronts. And now the storefronts are actually part of the units. The person that has the apartment, this is a piece of furniture in their apartment. Well, in every unit, we try to incorporate uh, some of the features of the old building um, in, the, in the new units. Every unit, well, every, all of the plumbing, the wiring, the air conditioning, the sprinkler systems are completely new throughout the building. Completely new. Nothing is reused, nothing is reattached, just completely new. So, most of the time when that happens, the plumbing system gets, well, look for yourself, the plumbing system gets pretty complicated. And in this sense, the plumbing pipe is exposed because we had to replicate the beadboard ceiling. So, we wanted not to cover this up with soffit. We wanted to reshow the beadboard ceilings, the original beams, and thus you come up with some of these, the plumbing becomes a feature in itself. Well, we're standing on the catwalk of the original building of 1910, uh, pretty much a box shaped. The catwalk went around the box on the inside. Uh, as I understand it, that there was a lot of shelving behind us, and that's where all, they stored all of their goods and warehoused all of their goods. Uh, when we found the building, and I, 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 I'm pretty sure it was probably in the 1970, couldn't even go back to 1950, this was, this was not exposed to the store. So the general public never saw the catwalk. Uh, but also, the reason why we exposed it, we, we were showing off the original crown molding from 1910. Uh, it's really elaborate unheard of today, it's really three pieces that probably was made on site directly from the log. 
We also have the original beadboard ceiling, which we, this is the, we're in the commercial area. The original beadboard uh, ceiling, and we've had to put a special fire retardant material uh, on the ceiling, but that will expose and that will keep the original beadboard ceiling. Let's talk about this area where the catwalk is and what your plans are for that as, as the building development continues. Yes. Well, I think this will probably be the closest of what we'll return to the original building. This is a 5,100 square foot area. Uh, and as it stands now, we have two potential tenants. Uh, one's a boutique shop, boutique shop and one is a gift shop. And pretty much as they're making their build outs and we're prescribing to the limits set by the National Park Service, uh, it's going to have to pretty much lay out like the original building, meaning the beadboard ceilings will be exposed, all of this is going to be exposed, the terrazzo floors have to remain, so it will probably the closest thing when a person walks in, they'll see a gift shop, they'll see a, a dress shop, um, and you know, it'll have the Muller's name and it may be able to bring back some, some type of memories. It'll be the closest things in the memory, uh, in the memory bank for people to recall on. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, the corner apartment actually stands out better in a sense because we've kept an original wall in each unit. Uh, the corner apartment actually shows two walls, so two of the four walls, so to speak, are the original brick, the original wood windows, the original wood trim, the original beams, and the original wood floors. Now most of these floors, the condition we found them in the condition they were covered with carpet. And this, these are the original hardwood floors, probably southern pine, and probably were 100 years old when they were laid. And so 100 years later, they're probably 200 years of virgin pine. And the pine shows outstandingly because that's the, the, the loud cherry color that comes out. Well, we're on the third floor of the building, which was uh, mainly the executive offices. There was a number, number of other shops up here, but we're actually standing in the accounting department. And they had a room here, probably uh, 12 by 15, 14 by 18, that was a three brick thick wall vault. And this was the actual doors that led into that. Um, rumor has it that they would store their jewelry in here at night, um, cash, uh, probably any valuables at night that they needed. But when we came across it, it was actually on the demo plans to remove, but one, it might have been costly to remove, so we said, why don't we just leave it? And we now made it a feature of one of the walls in this particular unit. Well, this is actually our architect's idea. And we're, you're standing in the part of the building that was built in 1910, which was a complete wood frame structure. I'm standing in the part of the building that was built in 1950, which is a complete concrete structure. Uh, obviously, you see the brick on your side, the terracotta on this side. And this particular unit is one of the five two-story units. And we have our skylight above us because of what is a term called FAR, Florida Area Ratio. We were not allowed, since we, have, we were built on zero lot lines, we were not allowed to put a window here because if our neighbor ever decided to build a building, then our window's covered. So what we did in order to get enough light is put skylights on this particular floor. When you go up to the second floor of this unit, the unit shifts to the middle of the building. That was important for the National Park Service because any structure that you add to the building cannot um, conflict with the original facade or the original view of the building. So uh, this goes, this, my, hands, my hat's off to the architect because he figured this out and actually we tried to build it and I think we did, we're pretty successful with it. Uh, well, like the uh, escalator, uh, I think sometimes people get confused between the escalator and elevator because they both have fond memories of both. Usually the escalator, as we said previously, is, was too, they don't re recall it being so small. They, they now see the elevator and it's, I can't believe it's this big. But as I was a child and a lot of children, uh, the guy that ran the elevator operated the little candy shack or booth right next door. So obviously we hang out here while our parents are shopping, buying candy and really taking rides. And if everyone recalls that this was a hand operated elevator, you, you would whistle or push the button, the elevator guy would come and get you. Unfortunately with today's code that we have to re, uh, bring the elevator up to code, it'll have to be an independent elevator where it'll be self-operating. 
uh, and we do lose the handle. But uh, some, we're going to figure out a way to keep the handle and just maybe uh, show it as a dead feature inside the elevator, just so people can recall that. But that was, uh, this is one of the uh, focal points of the building this morning. Thank you guys for coming. This is a lot of fun. This project has been a lot of fun. A lot of work mixed in with, with the fun, but uh, I'm glad we're at this point, trust me. It, this, uh, this has been a tremendous project. This downtown has been more fun and, and more re rewarding than anything you know, that I've ever done, and it's just it's incredible. And this, this tops, tops all that. I, I, uh, and I think it'll bring more to the, to the table for the future. For our, for our downtown and for Lake Charles, and, and that's what this is all about. We never forgot the trust that the family put in the police jury, and you know, and we just didn't want to just do anything with it. We probably had chances to also to sell it. We didn't really want to do that either. We wanted to make sure that the right thing was done with the building. Well, along in 2003 came Roger. But this is more than just downtown development. This is about a community. This is about people, and this is about what really makes communities so special. And you see the picture up here, you see the articles that have run in, in the paper, and there's something about a building, about a place that gives you a sense of belonging and a sense of just really a sense of, of that community spirit. And there's something about Muller's in Lake Charles. It's always been there. And it's just so remarkable to see how a community over all these years can share that experience even though we don't know each other, but we share that experience, we invest in that experience, that experience becomes a part of who we are, and then today, we celebrate the next generation for Mullers. But I'd like to thank each and, one, each and every one of you guys for coming, listening to me, and I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I've enjoyed this over the past four or five years, and hopefully Tom and I have a little bit more to do uh, in this city before it's all said and done. Thank you. The Muller's Loft's ribbon cutting ceremony brought the former Muller's employees back together again for a special tour of the building. They also had a chance to recall their memories of working at Muller's. I was the Santa Claus at Muller's in, I believe, the Christmas of 1974. It was, a, it was a thriving store at the time, lots of people, lots of business, uh, lots of children, as I remember, uh, and it was a very it was a joyous and happy time for me. Uh, uh, probably one of the uh, most exciting Christmases that I ever had. We were all family and we had such a good time. And I think of all the jobs that I've ever had, my best friends were here. And I mean, those friends are friends forever. I worked here in 1955 before I went into the service. And I worked here when I got out of the service in 1957. Worked here part-time when I taught school. So men's suits and men's slacks. Did great work. In fact, uh, Mr. Marks, Adolph Marks offered me a training for a buyer's job, and I really considered it quite a bit. Uh, decided to get into teaching instead. Oh golly, I retired the year, I guess, before they closed. And I had been here somewhere 20 years or more. 
and I worked here in the early 50s. Fact is, the earrings I have on are bought here. And I still have it. There's a few little rhinestones missing, but pleasant memories. I got pregnant while I was working here. <laughs> so I have a lot of, a lot of happy memories of mothers. I came to Lake Charles in 1945, and this was the first job that I had. And I think I even remember my salary was $16.52 a week. <laughs> so that, this building sure is, it's nice to come back to it. And like I said, the only thing I remembered was the escalator and the big elevator in the back. Because it's been so many years since I... And I came to work at Muller's in the fall of seven, 1976. I was a senior in high school, and one of the uh, programs they had at school was DE, Distributive Education, and that you could work part-time and go to school part-time each day. So they set me up with a job here at Muller's, and I dressed the windows, made the sales, uh, operated a press machine and made the sales signs and things, and then after I graduated from high school, I went to work in the sales audit department for two years. My father, after World War II, was the um, parking lot attendant. He was 21 years old, 1945. And I say that because now I laugh, because I always knew that growing up, that he was the parking lot attendant at Muller's. But I'm, now I'm saying 1945. How many cars could they have in Lake Charles? And, and how many parking lot attendants? But, but Muller's was a thriving business. It had, this was a two and a half acre parking lot that had cars, so therefore. Well, we always came up this back ramp obviously from the parking lot. If you didn't come down Ryan Street, you parked in the, the, the uh, spacious parking lot, come up the ramp, first thing you would see would be the candy on the right, the elevator guy on the left. You know, and I, again, as kids, that's what I saw, and I'm sure the parents probably went inside the store. Muller's is back as Muller's Lofts. It's already a big success, and people love it. Now the hope for the future is that Muller's can once again be a cornerstone of downtown Lake Charles. The emotional part aside, it is critical for downtown to get a 24-hour environment. And you are bringing a lot of people now living downtown who will spend money and use services, and it, they will draw others to the area. So we're very pleased with it. The police jury is Glad that we were a part of that, partnering with the city and their role in helping this come about, as well as the, the others who helped finance it. It was a true partnership, public and private, all the way. And we're just glad that the police jury could be a part of it. In terms of downtown development, it is going to be a cornerstone of the downtown development efforts for the future. In terms of providing the necessary human beings down there, that critical mass. Now uh, we have something tangible in Lake Charles that people can put their hands on. I hope that others take this project, make it better, uh, build similar projects. At least maybe it'll give them an idea. And, and, and I hope it is a stepping stone. I don't think it's the beginning, but I think it's part of the beginning uh, for the downtown and lakefront development. Residential components are really the key to long-term success and sustainability in a revitalization effort because then when you get the people here all day every day different service demands are, are required and met and so that really helps to spur um, additional revitalization in, in the downtown area. Oh, I think it's great yeah I'd love to have an apartment in here uh, particularly up the top floor it's got a great view up there. I am so impressed I've lived here all my life but I never thought I would see what I just saw of the apartments and how they utilized the walls and kept things natural, but yet looks great. It's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I wish I had the money. I'd want the corner, cor corner apartment either on the second or the third floor. They look down on Ryan and Division Streets. Those are beautiful. And it makes us all feel good to see that Muller's is really back. We think Julie Muller is probably looking down on us, happy, hopefully, 
about what has happened. That store's name will continue to exist here in southwest Louisiana. Everybody knows it, treasures it. It's, it's a great story for the police jury and in the entire region for Mullers. Now available for your viewing convenience, all meetings of the Calcasieu Parish Police Jury can be seen online in streaming video at cppj.net. The meetings will be archived and can be viewed anytime throughout the year. In the event of a natural disaster, special meetings and press conferences will also be made available to help keep you up to date wherever you are. Streaming video on cppj.net is another service brought to you by CGov, the Calcasieu Parish Government Channel.